So magic was harder than it looked. That's what I learned at that point. Magic is a lot harder than it looks, right? I think it was a Doug Henning that said, you know, we take the difficult and make it look easy and the easy look impossible. Welcome back to another episode of the Making Magic Podcast. I'm Sean Jay, your host, and I'm a professional magician, speaker, and 3D designer. And this is all about inspiring interviews with the movers, the shakers, the visionaries, and the makers, the wizards behind the curtain that make the magic for you. Now, if this is your first time tuning into the show, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to watch this stuff. It really does mean a lot to me, and I really do mean that when I say that, because this is a labor of love and a project of passion. So click that subscribe button if you are getting passionate and psyched and excited about watching this episode. Maybe you're already subscribed, and if you are, I really do appreciate every single one of my subscribers. Perhaps you're just listening to the sound of my voice on one of the many podcast apps like uh, Spotify, or we just recently got listed with the Apple Podcast app, the, the podcast uh, section. If you, you know that purple app on your phone, your watch, or your iPad, if you go there and you search for Sean J or Making Magic with Sean J, S H A U N J A Y, you will find the show there. And maybe you're just blown away and so excited want to share your passion about the show by leaving a healthy five-star review uh, for the show. People are already starting to do that and that really helps the show grow and helps it get seen by others and it would be greatly appreciated. So let's learn about our next guest. Now, his career in the world of entertainment began at the early age of six. By the age of 18, Clark already received national notoriety for his many awards and accomplishments as a young magician. Fast forward up to the year 2000, he won the World Magic Award for Best Classical Magic Act, which aired on CBS TV. You may have also seen Tony on NBC's World's Most Dangerous Magic, several TV episodes of Masters of Illusion, and a guest appearance on the ABC show Bachelorette and TV Land's The Soul Man with Cedric the Entertainer, just to name a few. Most recently, Tony Clark joined the ranks of the elite few who fooled Penn and Teller on the TV show Penn and Teller Fool Us. Please help me welcome Tony Clark to Making Magic. Check it out. Hey, Tony, how's it going? Welcome to Making Magic. Thank you, buddy. How are you? Great, great. It's good to have you on the show. I've wanted to have you as a guest because I know you really fit the bill based on your, your history and everything that you've been doing lately. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, tell us, I'd like to, as I always open the show, I'd like to start off with a story. And so as my guest today, Tony, I'd like you to tell me the story about the very first thing you ever created or you ever made or invented and it could be a good or a bad story and funny stories are always welcome oh this is cool um when i was a kid probably six years old seven i saw a magician on wonderama it was a tv show back in new york city i lived in connecticut back then and it was bob McAllister. he was famous and had a kids show and he had a magician with a, a, a box like this and he would rattle it and have somebody else rattle it and it wouldn't rattle. He would pick it up, give it to somebody else, it wouldn't rattle. And I was going crazy trying to figure out, he had two boxes and they would switch. And he'd open them up, there's nothing in there, and then he'd rattle it. Mm -hmm. Going out of my mind, I, then I started figuring it out, my own method. I don't know if it really worked, but I did, I got like a, a little packet of rosary beads because I was in Catholic school. They came in this little box and they shake it. And you shake them, they made a noise. So I just stuck it up my sleeve and pretended that was it. And that was my method. So I don't know, you know, kind of worked, but I was trying to figure the trick out. That was the first time I actually started like deconstructing something and trying to make it work. That wasn't the right method, but it, for me, it, it was the method at the time, but that was my first uh, remember, remembering of, of recreating something, trying to make something. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. 
Very cool. Yeah. And um, so what was the reason why you made it? Was there a specific reason or was it just out of inspiration trying to... I just like wanted said, to know. I was so quick. I was so like, how do they do it? I had to know. I just wanted to know how to work. It was so fascinating to magic. It blew me away as a kid. It just blew me away. And I couldn't rest without trying to at least go down in my basement, try to figure it out. And then, you know, cut to, you know, 40 years later, I'm making stuff. So here you are, here you are 40 years later, still figuring it out, right? Oh yeah. You never finish it. You never, that, you know that you never figure that out. We never yeah. know. Anything. It's impossible. No, you're always polishing, always working on. Yes. If, if you are, if you are good, not good, but a uh, better word for it is if you're wanting to stay on the cutting edge and always improve your art, yep. you're always working on stuff. Okay. And what did you learn from making it? Well, I learned that magic is harder than it looks because when I saw the guy do it, it looked, you know, flawless. Mine, obviously, had a, you know, I couldn't really do it right because I had this thing on my sleeve, which is not the way it worked. But so magic was like, more intriguing doing a while this guy did it and i couldn't even tell what he was doing so that was cool so magic was harder than it looked that's what i learned at that point magic is a lot harder than it looks right i think it was at doug henning that said you know we take the difficult and make it look easy and the easy look impossible was that his quote yeah and that's the problem too with magic sometimes because we work so hard and we don't want to make it look hard <laughs> so correct an oxymoron that we don't get the credit for the you know 20 years of working on a pro uh, a, a trick uh they see the final result well, oh that's yeah. easy yeah it is easy you know. <laughs> now <laughs> so it's kind of a weird thing people just don't see the work i call it the invisible work that we do oh it's yeah it's totally invisible because it's just i tell i for people who don't know i tell them this magicians work for years and years and years to hide their skill and jugglers work for years and years and years to show off their skills so it's a really weird uh, place that we're in. Yeah. in in magic it's like I mean just just think of the people that are still working on the perfect pass it's like right, right. you know yeah. and, and in my mind it's like there's so many other ways to do that nothing wrong with it but right. I mean for somebody who's gonna dedicate 20 some years of their life before they even feel semi comfortable doing it it's kind of like you know wow. you could have done you could have done a lot more yeah. in that time do a ribbon spread pass or something, you know. Just, yeah, just just move on, like, so you can move on with your life, right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like the approach I, I've taken, um, maybe for worse, but I would always, I would just basically try to learn what I needed. Um, I didn't, like, I wasn't, like, a dabbler. I, mm -hmm. I was more focused on, like, what I needed. I would go towards that and learn that. And anything mm -hmm. that would support it around it, I would learn that. But I wouldn't just learn stuff for the sake of learning it, you know. I mean, I learned a lot of cool moves back in the day. I can still do them, but you know, when I'm really, when you really work, you realize you only need like a handful of stuff, like hardcore, pass, uh, uh, force, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, palm, you know. So there's a handful of things you need to know. That gets Tools of the trade. The real work, yeah. So. Okay. Now, knowing what you know now, and how actually, how long have you been into magic, Tony? Well, let's see. Uh, it's, oh, my God. I started when I was six, uh, and I'm 55. So what's that? Uh, 40 so, some 49. years. 49. 40, 49, yeah. 40, wow, 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 wow. That's, that's yeah. very respectable. Applause for that one. Uh, what, knowing what you know now, after 49 years of experience, what would you wish you have told your younger self to prevent the mistakes that you had made along your career? Wow, interesting. I think I may have involved, I did have mentors. I had Slidini, then I had my mentor Bill Andrews after that. But I think maybe doing more like in maybe with more people like creating more of a, a synergy of people you know uh, uh like jamming you know uh when i jam now it's like cool because you come up with ideas you got four or five people uh thinking about one thing and, and it's cool so maybe i wish i did a little more of that and then um also i think the it was always a race of always get to the next thing and as you get older you feel mm. like you know it's not a race anymore it's just about doing the quality work 
and maybe you don't do as much, but do it well. So that's my focus now, it's like really picking and choosing what I really want to do. Um, Cause I was always running and running and running, running, running for years, 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 moving, moving here, moving here, moving there, move to Tahoe, move to Vegas, move to uh, Eagle Lake, uh, you know, Reno, blah, blah, blah. So now it's like, okay, let me uh, slow it down and pay attention more and actually focus on what I'm doing and really make it the best I can. And that makes it more enjoyable too. And more memorable too. Yes, I agree. Those are really two good core concepts that just anybody, whether in magic or not, because uh, one of my goals with this program is to share it with the public as well. And, and we all have life lessons, core concepts that carry over to whatever industry that we're in. And in your case, what I got from what you said was the first core concept was collaboration, learning the importance of collaboration. So magicians, of course, we call that sessioning or, you know, going to conventions or, you know, bouncing off ideas with our, with our colleagues. And that could apply to any industry. And, and then you said uh, focus, basically, uh, which is a thing that a lot of people have issues with uh, because it's just the shiny object syndrome. And in, in right. our industry, right, it's so easy. So easy, yeah. It's, it's so easy to, to open a catalog and look at the next best thing or see a, a promo video online for the next latest and greatest iteration of whatever that start, originated in Tarbell, probably, by the way. Right, right. And, you oh. know, how that goes. So um, focus. Focus is really important. It's something that I have an issue with. It's something I still struggle with. I've gotten better over the years, but I will admit um, I find it hard to focus because, I mean, with, with our art, with our industry, there is really always something that we could be learning or going on to the next thing right. or buying. Right. Um, but it's, it's nice. I, I agree with you that focusing on, you know, you find what you're good at and then you, you drill it down and you focus in on it. So then you become the best at whatever that is. Yeah, and, and what happens too is I learned when I was in those phases of my life when I was really focused, like before I came to LA, I was in Connecticut rehearsing in my parents' basement, you know, my dove act, you know, low pipes, asbestos covered pipes, low ceilings. And I'm rehearsing my act. You know, Watch out with the fire. Yeah, right. That's, that's good. The fire, yeah, the fire was not a problem. <laughs> that's just take out. Uh, so <laughs> it's funny. Uh, I never thought of that, actually. Um, yeah. It's good. Yeah, asbestos is flammable, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, but I focused there so much that I attracted, you know, my mentor, Bill Andrews, saw how serious I was. So that's what I tell people when they start. If you're really into something, people, you don't have to tell people. They'll see you go, wow, this guy's really into it. And some people may come out of the woodwork to kind of help you, like, oh, this guy's good, or give you advice, or, you know, I never, I never took a handout, but I always listened, and I always learned from people. You know, my mom, you know, she was an immigrant Italian, tiny lady, barely five feet tall. She's, you know, she went through the war. She was very smart, but not book smart, but very smart. Street she smart. says, you want something and you see something, if you grab it and take it, it's stealing. But if you watch it with your eyes and you do it, that's learning and that's a gift. So that's what you do. You learn, you watch, and you do it yourself. You know, I never took anything from anybody. I just always learned from them and went on. And that applies to whatever you do in life, you know, really. Mm, very good. Very good advice from, from the wise Italian mom. Right? <laughs> Not only did she give you great recipes, but she gave you great life advice too, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> Italian yeah. moms, they, that's where it's at. Oh, yeah, um, Brian, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they are. They're, they're something else. One of a kind. Um, tell us about something that you have recently made, like a favorite thing of yours that you have recently made. Perhaps you have it there around the desk, desk nearby, or maybe it's on your website. Or... Uh, let's see. Recently, it's interesting. I've been working on a few projects uh, with Jason Latimer. Yeah, oh, he... Jason Latimer. He's fantastic. Awesome. I've been begging him to get on my show, but he's busy doing... So oh, he's stuff with social media stuff right so now. Busy right now, yeah. I talked Very. to him yesterday. And I talked to and I and I and I've been working with him, consulting with him, and building props for his science, possible science. Love it. And it's cool because it's not like a trick. He wants it to look like a real thing happening. He shows yes. the magic, and then he shows you the science version of that with science principles. But we never exactly. Reveal. We don't reveal the trick, which is great. So that's been fun. I've been doing that. I have a new product uh, called uh, Matrix Kit where you can make coins appear on the table and cards appear on the table. 
and you know, I make most of this stuff, unfortunately, I said, unfortunately, because it takes a lot of time by hand myself. Um, you know, pros and cons. It's yeah, good. Yeah, you have to make it. You know, it's like otherwise the costs get too big, and the, you know, it's all about pricing. And there's so many products coming out these days. Like you know, every week there's like five new products coming out between all the major shops out there. So it's hard to keep up. But you know, I, I just have some good stuff that I'm working on. I just started making some uh, uh, rose to silks recently. It's a little batch of those cute little things. You know, I would love to show how to make them because people won't realize, as you know, when you make something it's a lot more than it looks. So I have this little tube with this little, you know, plastic, elastic threads going through with a little pin on it, but there's like five, six operations to make that little product, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like, well, you a hundred bucks, but you can't, you have to make it 30 bucks or whatever it is, but it's, people don't ever realize how much work goes into those little gimmicks. You know? And I know you do, cause you make a lot of great stuff too, with your printer and everything. Oh, thank uh, you. So yeah. yeah, it doesn't meet, you know, people don't see that either, you know, so. Yeah, enjoy. it's weird, right? Like on the product side too, same thing in our industry. People, they see the end result. It's like if, you, for instance, all, all of these flap card things, you know, you buy a flap card and you go, oh, it's a, a flip that flaps and the flip flop, right? It's a, no big deal. But yeah. man, sitting down with an X-Acto knife and getting all those cuts and it's really difficult. It takes a lot of patience. Oh yeah, I can't imagine. Uh how long it takes to make some of that stuff you know so but uh you know that's still so i like making that it's it's fun to make stuff i have a new uh, uh, close-up uh, case with a, a mat that comes on and off uh that fits inside so it's a really nice case so i have those so i'm always, I'm always trying to it's it's a, it's a nice getaway for me when i'm in the shop you know it's kind of a meditative to build and being there put some nice music on or listen to something nice and build stuff so to me it's almost therapeutic kind of a different whole different world of performing or teaching you know so because now i have a studio of magic so i have an online studio um so i teach lessons and give seminars to groups and uh, very nice okay classes. Uh, so that's why i have this set up it's not totally done yet but it's getting there i just have this new look a new camera looks good backdrop yeah so uh so that's you know that's uh that's what i'm working on okay Okay, a lot, a lot, obviously. Uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that you are. I didn't know that thing about uh, Jason. That's, that's great. That's, his yeah. stuff really excites me just because he's, he's bringing it to a wider audience and he's using it as an education tool, which I think is really cutting yeah. edge. Yeah, definitely. So um, back to Tony. What maker techniques? And I know you you're pretty well versed in a few of them. I know you do a lot. You do a lot of woodwork, right? Yeah, a little woodwork. Oh. Um, I wish I could do more, but I don't have a big enough setup for it. You know, I sure. grew up with wood. I went to carpentry high school actually. I have four oh. year carpentry uh, trade school. I uh, diploma in carpentry. <laughs> so uh, I just really went there to learn how to make magic tricks. Really, I built tables in those four years. I built rabbit boxes, and you know, had had a whole shop. You know. And they never had wood because it was a state school. So I'd bring my own wood in and make my own stuff. And, you know, it was great. Um, so I do some woodwork, uh, fabric stuff, uh, stuff with uh, plexi and, and lucite plastic sometimes, uh, hot glue for certain things, for felts and stuff like that. Uh, materials like close-up pads, you know, wrapping and foam and stuff like yes, that. Yes, you make your own line of close-up pads, correct? Yeah, that's, I've been doing these for a long time, and I, they get better and better. It's funny, I still improve them as I go. You know, the last year or two, I came up with better techniques, and they look the same, but I think they'll last longer, and it has a little more, um, uh, you know, solidness to it. So I always improve stuff. Like even my recently, I just improved my uh, uh, spike through balloon. It's a little lighted spike that you light. It's about this mm. long. I you, saw the video of that on Instagram. Through, yes, yeah, and it goes through. And I made it before and it used to have a plastic tip on them and I used to sharpen it, but the plastic doesn't last, you know, the tip. So I finally said, you know, what? I want to make this better. So I added a steel pin to the top and, and now it's like butter it goes right through and I've been right. making it forever. And I'm like, you know, it's always in the back of my head. I was never hundred percent satisfied with it. Now I could do it. Barely have to lubricate the, the thing. It just goes, man. It's so nice. So it's always fun. It's fun to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, you're always improving because you actually care. <laughs> it's the people who care. 
right? That are that are improving. The people that don't care, they just they they'll they'll stop too early and they'll just leave it at that and put it out to market just because they want to make some money. Right. But well, I have to feel good about doing it. Like I I take it personally. If I can do this, feel good about it, then it's okay. Then you can have it. So I'm always thinking about that kind of stuff. Yes, that's a good that's a good attitude to have. It kind of, it kind of passes, you know. If it's if it's going to have your name or your signature on it, it, it better pass your your quality standards because it's like um, it's almost like a business. Each product that you sell and put out, it's like a business card for you, right? True. It represents you, right? That's it right. represents you. I know. Um, it kind of reminds me of something my mom told me. My mom uh, is a professional photographer, and she has has that's been her passion in life for a very long time and she would always tell me that when she was learning uh, from the guy that she learned from she kind of apprenticed under a few people but he would always tell her he, he said you know your final photo that you give the client that that represents you if you give them a poor quality photo people are going to assume that that's your all of your work is poor quality right. whereas you give them you, that one shot you give them that good picture uh, they're going to most likely want to do business or they're just going to assume that you're great. So each thing that you put out, it's got that Tony Clark seal of approval. Oh, which I is try good. my best. You know, you can't please everybody, but right. I try my best. <laughs> right, right, right. No, that's all good. Uh, are there any uh, maker techniques with, like we discussed woodworking and, and uh, fabrics and hot glue? Are there any things that you're excited about learning this year, perhaps? Any new techniques that you may be incorporating into your products or your show or well i just it's funny because i grew up in a glass shop when i was a kid oh glass screens it was in a corner of my street so I, I started working there when i was about nine years old and um i did this technique back then somebody showed me this technique back then but recently i had to do this technique for uh one of jason's product uh, uh, uh tricks so it's bending uh lucite plastic Oh, cool. It's a, it, yeah, it's a band of uh, heat coil, and you have to make it yourself. They send you this band. It has all heat coils in it. Like It's a ribbon. Like This maybe you think, 30 or 40 inches long. Had to make a trough in the wood for it. Had to put wow. tin foil down, nails to stretch it out, a little um, wire for the ground so you can get electrocuted. And then I plug it in, and then you lay the loose site on top and you wait till it starts bending on its own. Wow. Bend it, and you put a square on it, pull it away, a few seconds, it's solid, and that curve is like a beautiful round, I did quarter inch for him, the uh, plexi, and it was cool and so strong. So I'm like, that's a cool technique. I haven't done it like since I was a kid. That's that that is pretty. that is fantastic. The um, Yeah, t so, so you're basically making perfectly geometric proper curves out of lucite yeah yeah you have to make sure you have a square available so when you bend it up and you hold it and yeah. then you sit for a second you pull it away you let you let it stay cool it cools pretty quick really and you pull it away and there you are and it's just and the you know thinner the plastic the faster the quarter took a while i was sitting there it was like i think it took like five to seven minutes sitting on the heat ribbon and the ribbon's only like three quarter inches uh thick or so yeah, and I would okay. imagine it would take that time. I mean, quarter inch lucite, that's almost like um, uh, the windows, the bulletproof glass windows they yeah. put on a bank. Yeah, it's pretty thick, uh, but it's so strong. You know, you can make shelves, you can make, uh, you know, anything you want out of that. It's pretty exciting, you know. So I have some pieces here and uh, uh, I have it in my head now. Eventually, you'll see something come out with the, you'll see, you'll be, the, you'll be like, oh, yeah, there's that plastic thing he's doing with the plastic bending. <laughs> The curved, curvy plastic thing. Yeah, yeah. So I got to come up with some ideas to use that because it looks cool. I mean, it just looks good. I mean, the way the it looks. The clear lucite. There's a lot of things you could do with that, and I, I think is is lucite basically a product of polycarbonate? Is that the the main? Uh, I think it's similar. I think yeah, polycarbonate is uh, what's the one that's called uh, Lexan. Lexan yeah. is bulletproof. Polycarbonate. It's a much harder one. Yeah. Uh, and that is, uh, they say it's bulletproof, but it, it basically doesn't shatter. It will right. take the bullet and it'll stop it sometimes or just slow it down. But yeah, that's that's a polycarbonate. Yeah, that's very, very strong. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I was just curious the difference. I knew they were similar. I did a polycarbonate related project uh, oh. 
for uh, for Bill Smith to make something oh. very, very, very strong. Oh, good. So yeah, that's for, strong. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's I, I could have gone I could have gone with any plastic, but I chose that. So cool, right. cool. Well, I think that that is a very cool technique. I haven't even heard of it until today. So you learn something new every day. This is a making magic first. Yep. YouTube it is a guy out there that shows you from the company that sells those things and they'll give you exactly how you do it. It's great. Wow. Okay. Great. It's hot though. You gotta be careful. You have to be very careful. You don't wanna burn your house down because you have it's very hot. Of course, of course. Use extreme caution only. Yeah, it's not something that you do like in your bedroom. You gotta no. be have a pro set up for that, I think. Yeah. A lot of tin foil and they they actually say use like, you know, fireproof material underneath if you have it and then the tin yeah. foil. I didn't have any. I just put like four layers of tinfoil. It was fine because I did like one or two curves. That was it. Yeah. Nice. Okay. What about, let's go back in time, back to the favorite thing that you made. So we talked about the matchbox thing and that was right. the first, right. but is there something that you made in the past? It could be a year ago or 30 years ago that you made, you would consider your favorite thing that you made. Oh, my favorite thing. Yeah, your favorite prop, your favorite whatever. Well, when I was a kid, I was fa uh, fascinated, infatuated with card castles. I don't know why, but it was a small magic shop in my area called Malo Magic. Nobody really knew of him, but he had his own little shop. It was a very small little place, and he'd make stuff in there. And I'd go sometimes, and I'd sit there, and he'd maybe sit there and watch, and he'd make card castles. And I learned the techniques of how he did it. And I just was fascinated by it. I make little mini ones. I make regular card ones. I make jumbo ones. And I, you know, and years later, I made a comedy card castle one. You know, the card, a card that's wrong. Flip it, turn it over. It's a little mini card castle. You turn it around, and all the cards are in the back. The same card. But I just love making those card castles. I don't know why. It's like a little. It's just interesting. You know, it's like a trinket toy. But uh, yeah, I mean, you just pull up, and it works, right? <laughs> yeah, it just stays. It, to me, you know, it looked magical. So. Uh, that was a big thing then, uh, and now I think uh, I helped. I can't tell you exactly what it was, but I did something sure. with Danny Cole recently. With who? Danny Cole. Danny Cole, another fantastic. Yeah, wow. I don't know why I haven't had him on the show yet. Now, thank you for. Yeah, he. Me. He's good. His thinking and his uh, wife Stacy. Uh, they have their own routines they're working on, and I worked on something with her too. It was great, you know. I love doing stuff that's not mine sometimes because it's it's just I'm free and I can help other people because they have their like, you know, like you too. Like we're all the same. Everybody else can have other, better ideas than we have sometimes because we have our own little, you know, challenges that we think we have. But other mm -hmm. people are like, oh no, do this. Like oh okay, so that's why it's good to collaborate. But uh, yes. I think recently the, the coolest thing I did was I think like my. Uh, my, my cases, my new cases, I like. My new uh, close-up cases. Okay. Came out really nice. I like the way they uh, the pad goes in the lid. I like the way it stays in there. This is all new. I never did it before like this. I like the way it attaches and the look, uh, the size. And so that was the latest that I did, and I, I enjoyed making those. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The close-up cases. And... Yeah. And my salt pour, I like making my salt pour. It's like, it's a cute gimmick. I like making those. I hand paint them. And... Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a whole multi-step process that you've got going on there. I've seen some photos on your Instagram. You have them all lined up and... Yeah, all the little bold things and you, yeah, you line them up, you know, so. I just like it. It's just, you know, to me, it's playing around with the, the magic and, you know, some guys just perform all the time and I mix it together, you know. That's what I choose to do. That's what I like. That's good. That's good. Creation becomes your meditation, basically. Ooh, I like that. Is that your mm -hmm. quote? It is now. I didn't hear it until it just popped into my head to say it. <laughs> meditation or creation is my meditation. Ooh, I'm going to have to credit you if I use that because... Credit Sean Jay. I, I honestly don't remember reading it anywhere. Nobody ever told it to me. I was just thinking about... The first well, thing that you said that's was, perfect, man, that's like a, that's like a logo for a, something like a catchphrase for a company. Creation is my meditation. Ooh, I like that. Good job, Sean. You're welcome. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, okay. that's, that's, this is, this is called collaboration right here. Collaboration, creation, awesome. meditation. Yeah. If we weren't talking and talking, it would never appear. 
between the two minds, it just went like this and it created mm -hmm. the, that one other thought. So mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. example right there, ladies and gentlemen. This is making magic first. Then you just uh, saw a way, uh, the way collaboration actually works. Exactly, exactly. So being that it is uh, a meditative, it's, it's, it's meditative for me as well, especially like when I do the electronics, like um, I have to really get in the mood for it. I have to carve out some time uninterrupted, but when I do the electronics, that can get very uh, much like a meditation. I put some music on and I, and I get to it and I just laser focus in. And uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of relaxing once I can, provided that I don't burn myself repeatedly. I actually have a scar on my arm uh, from the soldering iron slipping and missing. So hot. But see, but there's a good point you just made. What's happening here is it's forcing you to be right in that moment only because it's dangerous and you also have to pay attention to what you're doing to make sure it's right. Yes. So that is meditation because meditation is staying in this moment. And you're and it's it's enjoyable because you're getting rid of everything else that you normally think about that's just noise yes and that's why when you do like even guys that do extreme sports the same thing they love it because it's such the, it forces them to come into this one moment then and there and only there mm -hmm. free from everything else it really frees you up you know um, that's what I felt when I saw uh, David Blaine's live show uh, did you see it I did. I saw it in Richmond, Virginia. It was fantastic, a very memorable experience. It was so unique and weird and, and magical, and, and it was just, yeah. I walked out of there with my friend. I said, you know, I called him a couple days later. I still have a feeling about that show. A great lesson. And I said, and he didn't have that many props. I mean, he no. literally could put all his props into his water tank, and he could have had it trucked off in just one tank. That's how many, it wasn't about the props. No. No, but right. the lesson was that whatever he did, mostly I would say ninety percent of what he did had to be extremely focused because it was dangerous. And mm -hmm. it, you're watching somebody being in the moment. That's a, a rarity to see that over and over again. You know, like you see a sports guy, you'll you see them in the moment at certain moments. But he's through this whole like routines. He's in the moment. He's doing these extreme things. He can't mess around. He's putting stuff through his arm. He's swallowing stuff. He's spitting out uh, fire. He's underwater. So I left here going, wow, I never felt that in the show, like that much. Yeah. The artist is in the moment. You know, that's, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to watch because nobody gets to see that that much in this crazy busy world. Where it, yeah, the that, that in the moment feel, it, it, it gives it, it makes it less scripted, right? Because people think that they aren't just following along a timeline right. and the show's going to end in, oh, 13 minutes now because he's 95% done with his script. You, you, right. feel, you feel that moment of suspense like, is this really going to work? Well, how is he going to get around that? Look, it looks like he's really having trouble there. Uh, right. maybe, maybe it's not going to work. And... And he's he's captured. I, he really has captured the spirit of Houdini in yeah. in every sense of the word. I know that was he was very inspired by Houdini. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah. It, it's a modern day type of Houdini that he understands that he's doing things that people really understand, but they can't do it. That's a big difference. Magic, you don't understand it. He's, his stuff is not really magic. It's more stunt type stuff that. Mm -hmm. I, I see what he's doing, but I just don't, I can't do that. You know, I understand what he's doing, but I just, there's no way I can do that. So it's kind of a inter very intriguing, uh, uh, you know, mindset of uh, doing that. But that was a good lesson. That was the bottom line with David Blaine was he was in the moment. He was in the moment. He was, it was his own meditation. Yep. It was concentration, concentration. and uh, patience. Yeah. Yep. Beautiful to watch. Beautiful to watch. Yeah, good lesson. Really, a lesson learned. Yes. Yes. What about um, what about since you've been making things? I guess for quite some time. You know, since you were uh, much, much, much younger with the card castles, and you know, forty nine years later, what would you consider your biggest DIY fail of all time? Something that you were working on just exploded in your face, or? Something uh, super dangerous uh, or crazy. I'm sure you've had a few of these, considering you're making all the time. And 
There's a f- couple. Um, we'll start with a dangerous one. Okay, okay, great. Let's do it. I, for my Dove Act, I always wanted to make a either a chandelier appear at the end because I was doing a Phantom of the Opera theme, right? I thought a chandelier, you know, kind of mixes in with the show. I need to make a chandelier. But then, you know, I heard Marvin Roy was doing his jewelry act and then making chandeliers appear. So, like, I kind of swayed off of that. So I talked to Fantasio, which is a friend of mine, God rest his soul, who passed away last year. Um, and I said, uh, is it possible to make a candelabra appear like you? He said, oh, yeah, you could do it. I sell those candles. You can make whatever you want. So he was like, oh, OK. So I had Sun Valley Sam, which is no longer here. He passed many years ago, but he used to build a lot of props right here in who, Valley. Who was the guy's name? Sun Valley Sam. Sam S- Ferenz. Sun Valley Sam. I've never heard older of this guy. Yeah, older gentleman. He passed probably 10 more years ago, maybe more. But he had a cool shop. He was a machinist, and he built some cool stuff. Hmm. So I had this idea, and I'm in Japan with Doug Malloy in Sundai, Japan, in the mountains, doing a show uh, at a club for like four months. So I got this idea. So I call Sun Valley Sam. I send him drawings. I mean, back then it was so like, you know, pay, had to be so patient, right? I'm in Japan. There's no internet. Yeah. So I made the drawings, and I told him what I want, and it basically was an upside down. My carousel is like this, like a like a, tri- a tripod top. Uh, at the end, I made the cage vanish. I wanted to turn it over, and I wanted the candles to pop up, and be lit, and have a candelabra. There's so much, so many dangerous things I could see happening here, going wrong and painful. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So here we. So I get it in the mail. I test the candles. I sent him the candles from Fantasio. Sent, he sent them over there, right? They were the self-lighting type candle, this and that. Uh-huh. So here I go. I go to test it. I push the button too early, so it ignites the lighter fluid in the candles. Oh! I have a, a, a gold male, or what do they call that? A, a material that's very shiny, like a metallic material on top. And it just went, you know, it just, just vanished, and the, like, the ring of wood was left. And it was like, holy cow. So the whole thing went up in spontaneous combustion, basically. Yeah, pretty quick, pretty quick. Because that fabric is so, like, synthetic. It's that lame, or a gold lame, you know. And that was it. And then, and then never, never did that <laughs> it just again. blew up, literally blew up. And $350 later, or whatever it was, it was a couple hundred bucks back then, whatever, it was, it was gone. Um, so that wow. was, that was, and I wanted that one so bad, you know. And then I had to, so many dub things I made. I made a pedestal with these uh, again a candelabra and the birds set inside the little you know little sconces uh-huh. and it was cool I, I would cover the thing up i would pick up the candelabra again i would pull it away and the birds would be gone i would do this and then push a button and the candles would appear oh nice another button pushing <laughs> fail there it was just complicated it looked cool i mean the pedestal looked good the method for the birds to vanish actually worked and I spent so much time on that with a roll top method for closing the thing and then this and that. And oh my God. But I was so into it, right? I thought this is it. Because back in those days, if you were a Dove Act, you had a, like a signature ending. You need your own signature ending. You know? Right, right. Make it your own, you know? Right, right. Ducks, people have this, they have shrinking cages. You know, I need to, like, so I was looking for this thing. I even went out to Vegas and did a condor production out of a blammo box. My friend uh, Joe Crathwall, he helped preserve the uh, condors like 25 years ago. Wow. So he had a license to uh, raise them. So I have a, a little small video, and I should put it up sometime, of me just making this giant condor appear from this blammo box. It's just insane. Wow. But that I couldn't do because, you know, the law, you wouldn't, allow, you wouldn't be allowed to perform right. with it. But anyway, but so there was that, and I, I did a thing with, uh, you know, I built many type of levitations through the years that didn't work. I uh, uh, had a thing with these uh, uh, sword suspension idea, right? <laughs> the old sword suspension, the big giant swords. Mm-hmm. I covered them, and it made it look like a table. Okay. And the girl lay down. Like the idea was, I when the girl's up there, I pull the cloth off. It's like a gag. Oh, and then people see now there's swords there. Mm-hmm. Now I go like this, and the table starts going down, and the girl's now suspended across the swords. Sounds great. Concept right? is good in, in concept, yes. Cool concept, and it's kind of a surprise because you don't the person you never thought it was a, a sword, you look like a regular table. Now, unbeknownst to the girl, she's on these swords, which I always liked because I thought I don't like putting her on there. I like her to get on herself. I had a special harness made, mm. and it worked, so I didn't have to lift her. 
Mm. So I spent money on I spent money and all these things, obviously. Oh, but, lots and lots of money. Yes, that's yeah. part of the prototyping yeah. process. Uh, in those days, I had not much at all. And it was weird. I would spend like everything I had. You know, I just had enough for rent and I didn't care. I get it. I get it. But, you know, but I could never get that table to work. I couldn't figure that out. It was just going to be too expensive to get that table to have scissors to go down. You know, these days it's a lot easier, I think, with servos. But back then it was different. So that was a failure too. I think I just threw that one in the trash. I think I sold the sword suspension and got rid of the table. You know, did, so. did the girl ever fall off the swords? No, never. They were strong. I okay. Mean, it, it was like a rock. I mean, that's okay. why I didn't want her to walk around with the thing on because it was so heavy. Ah. The safety of it was not. It was great. I mean, it was like solid, solid. You know, I even tried. I, had, I even tried doing a a broom suspension with a candelabra with the girl on one of the candles. It was like a, a candelabra, and I would, I even made a candle that kicked back so the flame wouldn't burn her, and it was like a fake flame, and she put her arm on the flame, and I had like a, a little thing here that looked like a flame, <laughs> and I would, but I just, I didn't like, I just hated lifting her, I didn't like it, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's Tony's problems with the candelabra, it seems to keep coming back to haunt you. <laughs> oh yeah, so if I think about it, that that's the theme. The candelabras just kept taunting me uh, all the way through, and I never ended up using a candelabra for anything. Yeah, yeah, I think it was like the universe special way of saying, Tony, stay away from the candelabra. It's not for you. Not worth it, buddy. Yeah. Not worth it. <laughs> not worth it. I think I made it, I may have would have stopped after that thing where all that stuff that you spent all the scared. hundreds of dollars just that went up scared. in flames. <laughs> it was a nightclub during the day, thank God, nobody was there, but it was like smelled like burning like tires you know rubber it's terrible <laughs> oh so this happened during a live show at a nightclub oh uh, yeah during the day we re i rehearsed it during the day oh it was during rehearsal thankfully not during the actual show no no i, I got it and i started rehearsing it during the day in the club oh, okay okay there because the club was only open at like late at night okay okay yeah. well, no, well no, I, never, I would never do it without testing it uh you know before show that's my big pet peeve with a lot of guys you know don't do something that like especially with danger that you have you better make sure it's right yes yes and no, uh I, I never did that again that was the last one yeah yeah that's first and last time that's baby that's it yeah so first we learn we learn we move on you know back in those days you're you know i never stopped it was like like i said it was like just go go keep going i would keep me down keep going you know it was a lot of energy just to keep going forward you know, um, I'm glad I did all that then because now it's like, I don't know if I would do the same things <laughs> because you're more cautious now, I, you know, it's a different world, different lifestyle now. Well, exactly. And you learn from those mistakes. You do. Yeah. 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 And uh, that's great. So learn from the mistakes, lose a couple eyebrows in the process, you know, when the flame gets high. <laughs> well, I've done that before too, back in the day. Uh, I burned my eyebrows, my eyelashes off one time, my one side of my face. Really? Maybe that could have been a whole new character or something. Uh, could have been. It was, it was like an idiot. I was doing a zombie routine. This is way back. This is when I'm living back home. I was probably 12 or 13. And I had this zombie routine, you know, at the end. Uh, I was in a vash. I didn't even remember. I think I cracked it open and it was like paper in there. And I had a cigarette for some reason because cigarettes were big back then. You when know, you were 12 I years old. 13 or so, 14, maybe. It was Great. Stupid. The cigarette magic was big. He used to do the, the gimmick with the cigarette production all the time, you know. Uh -huh. so I just find it funny that the age and, you know, yeah, I'm really, yeah. I'm 13, man. What's up? Yeah. Yeah, it's weird, right? Just, yeah. to light the, just like the flash paper. So when I rehearsed it, I would take it out and light it like this. In my hand, I would push it from my left hand out of my mouth into the, the flash paper. Uh -huh. but for some reason, I was nervous and I just put my face into it. Oh, no. Yeah, and I used to, you know, I used to use a lot of hair products then, so that wasn't good either. So I singed my eyelash, my hair, my little bit of my uh, eyebrow. But I never did that again. No, no. And <laughs> and this became, maybe was that the inspiration for the Phantom of the Opera? So you could like wear something to cover up the burnt off <laughs> hair? That's funny, I never thought of that. Uh, it wasn't, but uh, it would have been perfect. Uh, it was way before the Phantom, but uh, even came out. But. Uh, that would have been good if I had to. I would use that, you know. For the whole yeah, life. I mean, if the hair never grew back, you could just be permanently the Phantom of the Opera, just the Phantom known as Tony. Just that would have been you know. Great. Wow. I don't know. I'm just piecing it together here. Well, I'm glad that didn't uh, happen. But uh, you know, but that's what we know. What it is though. It's 
doing all these things that you learn. You know, you, we learn like you do. You try it, you fail. It's not a failure. It's just a learning lesson. Yes. Yes, a stepping stone to the next. I mean, it, I, I would say it only becomes a failure if, if the person wants to repeat the process known as insanity, where they're doing the same thing over and over and over again, and they're not changing anything, expecting a different result. result. Right, right, right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Right. So yeah. That's, I, I, that's considered a failure to me. But yeah, exactly. w when, when you're doing stuff like you and, and you're using it as a stepping stone, it's just you're working out the kinks and you're pushing it aside, and you eventually you polish it down and you uncover the gem that is underneath, and there it is. And yeah, a lot of it's like sculpting, you know, it's like a ball of clay. And you're sculpting. Keep, uh, my mentor used to always say that. He's like, you know, just put that ball of clay on the table. That's the first step. It doesn't have to look good. Just put that ball of clay there. If you don't put the ball of clay on the table, you have nothing to work with, right? So don't worry about it being perfect. Just get it there and just start doing it. Just start massaging. He would always say, massage it, massage it, make it better, massage it, make it better. That's a great... That is such a great analogy, actually. Uh, it's great. It's perfect uh, for me to understand. Yeah, and it's in anything you do, really, any any job or career, just start. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 like the you know the best time to plant a tree is now because it's just you you either do it or you don't. And if you plant it now, fifteen years later, it's the tree. Whereas if you're thinking about it. And you can't think a tree into existence. Just like a, a beautiful sculpture, you could think about Michelangelo, or you could start by just just this thing, yeah. and then start, like you said, massaging it, and eventually something nice will come out of it. Yeah, Keep it. that's all it is. That's all it is. It's little bit little too. You know, you don't have to take big chunks. Just do little parts. People get overwhelmed, like they want to get to the end so fast. The end comes when it's done. You know, you have to get to the end by doing the steps first. You just don't, everybody wants success, right? Right. Everybody wants to just get to the end, but don't get excited just by the end. Enjoy the way up and that becomes even better and easier. So enjoy the process, you know. The process, yes, yes. And that's, that's why people stay makers when, and because they enjoy the process. They, yep. I, I, I'm pretty guilty of wanting the final result because I'll end up making things often because I'll be right in the middle of working on a routine and I go, oh, I got it, I, I just need this. Right. And then I could, I could finish it, or it's this. And yeah. then I go, oh shoot, now let me try making it. Oh wow, this is not something I can do in five minutes. This might take five months right. <laughs> before right. I get this thing. It's okay, I mean, that's how you get your initial uh, inspiration. It's okay though, you know, that's how you start. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Some things, you know, you know the same thing. Some things come quick, some things don't. You know, I have right. a project now that I'm working on and I put it away. It's been about two years and it's good. I might do it online for myself. I was trying to, I was to think about marketing, but it's, it's got some things that would not be good for marketing, but I haven't been happy with that yet, but it's been two years over maybe three years now. It's, it's one of those things that, you know, it doesn't come that fast. Right. Right. Takes it's a, we're in it for the long game basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's the way it works, you know. And it's fun. As long as it's fun, you keep doing it. You know, thank God for this magic, right? To go into this pandemic, uh, I always say to people with magic, we had stuff to keep us in a positive frame of mind to work on yes. stuff. Creative outlet. You know? mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, like um, I know you're you're into the Buddhist philosophy, so you know about the concept of duality, and. Yeah that the pandemic is a whole lesson in duality where you have something negative and horrible that happens and so that's the downside but what's the you know there's the yin and the yang what's the black and what's the white what's the white and what's the black the cup is either half empty or half full so you on one hand yeah this this stuff happens but on the other hand the first place my mind went was time yeah look at all the time we have that we didn't have before and thus True. It's, it seems like you've taken well advantage of that time to, to continue to work on your products and create more products and uh, more offerings um, that yeah. you're doing right now. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's what I do. So it's not hard for me to do it after all these years. So you just, just have more time to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there definitely was more time because not traveling as much, you know, because traveling always bites into your projects. So, you know, you're gone for even a week is cuts into your projects, but yes. it's, a, it's a lot different now. Yes, yes.
Now, is there anything that you've ever created by accident and it turned out to be amazing? Without any goal in mind, you're just tinkering, right? And then all of a sudden, you have this magical thing that comes out of it. Oh, let me think about it. Uh, well, that's a tough one. Um, I'm sure there is somewhere in the world that I've, in my, you know, through the years. So something that just happened that happened to be cool that I did. Uh, what would that be? Hmm. It's okay. I'll, I'll edit. I'll edit the pause. Yeah. The pregnant pause. It's okay. I mean, you're thinking. No worries. Uh, I think... By accident. So, one of the things I created that ended up being better than I thought when I was doing my bird act, mm. I uh, wanted a way to produce uh, smoke as I vanished the cage at the end. Mm. Um, and I didn't want to use electric matches. I used like glow plugs, but they get dirty and they break after a while. And oh yeah, they're very sensitive. Yeah, they're very sensitive. You got to clean them all the time. And was, I had a glow plug in, inside, but I didn't like the smoke being inside because it never felt like it came out right. So I wanted to shoot this upward. Hmm. So I'm thinking, and I said, oh, uh, maybe just make it fun, make it like a little burst, like a party popper, the replaceable, right? So I got a little party popper and I made a little holder with a PVC pipe on an angle forward and it fit perfectly. A matter of fact, I think a three quarter inch like joint fits perfect in there. And I had a little string that I left hanging and all I just pop it and boom, came out. I say, like, oh, that's cool. Then at one point I'm playing with those body poppers. I go, oh, I think, what if I take all this stuff out? I smell it. I say, oh, that's like a little sulfury. It must be a little igniter in there. So I created it my own little mini flash pop from that. Now don't try this because it's very dangerous. But by accident, yeah, by accident, I created a little flash pot device, but there's a lot more that goes into it with yeah. release and the cover and how you cover it. But it was just by just taking apart the little party popper. <laughs> and no, that's that's actually great. As, as small and as insignificant as you might think it is, that's actually a big leap forward because um, that's really cool. So it's it's kind of the importance of taking something that already exists and hacking it per se. Like um, right. my first guest, which was Mario, the maker, magician, he yeah. um, he put out a video recently of of one of his one of his little robots, and he was explaining how he essentially hacked something that already existed, modified it, tweaked it just a little bit, and changed it into something completely different. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah, and and you know, in, in your case, you have a, a, a party popper. The, the great thing about that is, you're able to fig you find something that's pretty commonly, right. uh, you can commonly get, and yeah. and then uh, so you know, whenever these things break, you could always get the base model pretty easily. Oh yeah, easy to just find. Tweak it. Yeah, any party place, uh, you know, they're not explosive, so you don't need a permit, you know, for it. But they are, you know, don't look at them, everybody. Don't, don't put your face in there. It's, it's, right. It's, don't, don't, don't take the cigarette with the no, flash paper and go Just like this. Mouth and a gallon of gasoline in your hand and a potty pop. You know, don't. don't. <laughs> because we're going to have letters writing in to the Making Magic Show. So Tony so Clark so told me. How stupid is that? Just imagine me just lighting this stupid flash paper with the cigarette in my mouth. <laughs> oh my God. That's why I, why I never why I never smoked cigarettes either after that. I was like, oh my God. So that made you quit smoking? Well, I never smoked. I never smoked uh, cigarettes. Oh, you, yeah. you never started? Good. Good. I tried it as a kid, like we all do, but it was just disgusting. It made me throw up. You know, just stupid. A friend of mine was like, I hated it, you know? Right. Um, but, uh, yeah. So anyway, so it, it was good for a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, good. Um, what, what, would, um, what would you say inspired you to be a maker? of of props and and things in general it's interesting because for me my mom and dad immigrant italians my dad worked three jobs my mom worked for a little while but then we had a problem with a babysitter she didn't like she ended up staying home my dad worked three jobs wow yeah um 
he did landscaping on the weekends, painted houses inside and out, and apartments at a, at a big place uh, during the week. Um, and at night, sometimes he would, uh, you know, do other little odd jobs here and there. Um, and we were actually, no, sorry, he worked for the uh, city sanitation department in the morning, pulling the old days they had and pulled the garbage cans out to the street. That's oh, from Florida. he was a and, tough guy. Yeah, he's still there. He's still alive. He's a pretty strong guy. Um, he is a tough guy, I should say. He still guy. is. Very strong. So anyway, so I never asked him for money. I didn't have money to buy tricks, like, you know. So I remember the first thing I ever bought was a TV Magic Cards from Marshall Bodine. Ah, dead. yes. They were like two fifty. Oh wow! A lot back then, but you know they were in like five and dime stores back when they were there when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. I they were there, and like, oh my god, that's the the, the deck I saw on TV, and it says TV Magic Cards, and it was two fifty. My mom was like, well, two fifty? There's other cards here for fifty cents. They have these like colorful cards. She goes, no, you take this deck. I'm like, oh man. Okay, but we didn't have money to buy stuff. So I used to start making stuff myself. I started, I learned how to sew at a very young age. Um, Love it. It was a seamstress, but I would always have to go back and change it. So I learned how to do it myself because I hated bothering her. Love so it. Sew myself, but it was on a necessity I became a maker. All my Love stuff. Love it. I love I, that. I found like an old uh, cigarette stand, uh, like the, the stands with the little tray on top. I took the glass thing off, it was in the, like the garbage, and I sprayed it silver, put a top hat on it, screwed it in, I made my own top hat table from the cigarette stand, and I do that, I used to do that for manipulation. Love it, Build cool. Build my own tables, you know, and uh, a little forgetful Freddy, I made my own little forgetful Freddy with the head that pops off. You know? Oh, yeah. Kid shows, my own, my own suitcase tables I made. Um, because, you know, you, I would check the price, oh, a suitcase table, $175 back then or whatever. Like, wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a lot for a little little boy. Yeah, half my dad's salary. And I never really yeah. asked for that much. They bought me a little bit here and there later, but I couldn't even ask him. Because he's you know, three brothers, had three three boys in the family, raising mm. them, going to Catholic school, had to pay for that. I didn't have it in my heart to even ask for so money for anything. So I just made it. I made most of the stuff, I would say 80% back down myself, I made myself. Limitations forcing creativity. That is a, I think the best way to become a maker in the sense that you're, you have no choice. Well, so yeah. you're going to find out really quick whether you're cut out for it or not. Um, and let's, well, actually I take that back. It's not that certain people are cut out for it and others aren't. It's in your case, the limitation was the lack of money right. and to overcome that it was simply your desire and passion to get the result that you want yeah. you said okay well you can't buy it for me when I'm I don't know how old you were you little at the time say, all right well maybe I could maybe I could figure out a way to build this thing so that's that's great I, I have similar story in my upbringing in the sense that I did not come from a family with lots and lots of money and you know and when, when People see the what I've been doing now. Some people might make um, an assumption that oh, he's just a kid and his parents fed him all this money. No, no, no. Actually, my my uh, my mom always taught me to work, work, you know, work work for yourself, and then you make your own money that you could spend on whatever you want. It's so empowering to learn how to work for yourself, create what you want, create your own reality and make your own stuff, it, it's very empowering. It makes you, makes you feel, ve it's very satisfying. Yes, that's a big thing, is that uh, being uh, able to accomplish your own thing and achieve your own stuff is, is a nice feeling, because that, that could be repeated. People giving you stuff does not get repeated. That's right, so, because there's no concept that you learn, you're just consuming, right. you're just saying, Take it. Oh, cool. That's nice. And I think also it, it lowers the appreciation of whatever it is. Right. It's true. Yeah. You've got something that you work hard for, man. You protect that. <laughs> it's like. Exactly. Uh, and uh, Tony Robbins has a good quote. He says, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So when something's necessary to do, you invent something and make it happen. It's, I love that quote. You know? Yes. I think I mentioned it earlier during our chat is that real does that really belong to tony or did that come from tony, tony? robbins i think it's tony robbins yeah i was a big tony robbins guy back in the day 
Okay, well then it's Tony uh, Robbins. Uh, uh, late 90s when I was in LA and before I moved to LA, I did all these videos, all these cassette tapes and I went to his fire walk at oh. the studios and he had it outside in the parking lot, I walked through the coals. And... But you didn't bring your candelabra to that one, right? No, <laughs> it was, uh, maybe that inspired it. I think, was that before? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, I like fire. I've always liked fire, so okay. I gravitated to fire. I still like it. I still like you know flash pots and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fire, fire is great. It, the public likes fire. Humans in general like fire. It's just a primal attraction, I think. In our blood, in our DNA, yeah. Something like that. I don't know. Depending on what kind of show you do or don't do. Um, so, so basically, the lack of money. Yeah. And just those limitations inspired you. Was there any person in particular that uh, inspired you to, to do more of that? Or was it just you started out with no money, so you just started making stuff and it just snowballed from there? Or, or, there was uh, the gentleman I mentioned earlier, Pat Malo. He was a small little magic shop um, and he tiny little place, but he built stuff in there. And I used to watch him. He was an old machinist. He was a retired machinist, but was a magician. Ah, yes, he did say that, yeah. Worked for Fag Bearing, which was a big, I think it's still in existence now. They make bearings for people all over the world. Oh, a ba ball and, bearings. Yeah, yeah. And he had patents that he created for the company. He used to have them on his wall, you know, patents, oh. Pat Malo, you know, certificate of whatever. But, but he, he built stuff in there. And looking and learning, uh, I got into it. You know, I got into it. So Yes. Um, no, you're lucky. You're lucky. Yeah. You, he was your maker uh, mentor in a way. Yeah. Yeah, he was. Um, and then I worked at the glass shop as a kid. I would like, you know, clean the toilets and the bathrooms and vacuum when I was younger. And then later I would uh, get into the shop and start working on the tables. And they were so nice. The owner, uh, Gene Paqua and his son, uh, you know, it was like, they're so nice. They would let me use this, the shop to work on my stuff after hours. That's you lucked out with that one because yeah, that's yeah. a good, nice. Yeah. yeah, shop is always. I mean, because then you have access to all your tools, and you don't even have to have them in your house. You just go it's in there. Too that just having a big table available was so nice, you know. And the, the glass table would have carpeting on it, and then they allowed me to build on there. You know, it was so it was nice. It was a very nice thing. Um, so, but they saw the passion of what I loved. They saw me doing magic. They knew I loved it. You know. This is good for people to know because I know probably a lot of the magicians, at least the ones that don't know you well personally, don't know any of this stuff. They just think, oh, Tony Clark creates these cool things, and yeah, he had an award-winning Dove Act, but see, people don't understand that it just didn't pop into your, like these products probably did not pop into your mind out of nowhere. It was a result of this very early formative years where people like the like the guy with the ball bearing patents and like these people at the glass shop that gave you that permission to explore and tinker and play. And then you started doing that on your own and then you said, oh, this is really interesting. This is something that I like. And then it just built from there, correct? Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's, okay. all the, you know, it's like we're a product or environment, you know? Uh, right. Blue collar neighborhood, everybody worked hard, made their own stuff. Um, so I just kind of followed suit with that and um, and I liked it because I could customize everything, you know I cut my own colors for this and the, the right height and you know, so it was kind of cool That's right fun. Okay, okay now uh, is there anyone that you look up to in the maker space per se whether uh, like like modern uh, makers designers builders in your mind well interesting I haven't been exposed to a lot of builders. Even when I had my big show in Tahoe, I built a lot of the stuff myself. Really? Again, because I didn't have a budget back then to build it. So okay. I built in my little two bedroom apartment with some friends. We built a lot of our props. products, our props. Um, and it's interesting enough, my product line was just getting busier and busier and that actually helped me pay for the show. It was a weird thing. It just happened at the right time. So it kind of helped me build a show selling my products um but uh the builders i mean willie willie kennedy to me i like willie kennedy because he does a beautiful job with aluminum type stuff is willie kennedy in the magic industry or is he just yeah. an aluminum guy no, no no he's a big builder he works a lot with John, uh, uh jim steinmeier he builds a lot of jim steinmeier stuff oh, okay okay uh he makes really beautiful stuff aluminum lightweight but 
gorgeous. He makes the uh, what is it called the the the, the, the puzzle that the Kalen Jr. do. It's like the puzzle the puzzle parts. He does the double levy. He does. I mean, he does tons and tons of props. So. Mm. Uh, he's just making the new glass penetration with the four holes uh, that the, the Jim Stein, a lot of Jim Steinmeier stuff. Okay. But okay. I love his stuff. So clean. Um, I mean, Bill Smith, I like them all. They all have their thing, you know. Right. Bill Smith has some cool stuff, uh, you know, and I'm not familiar with, I mean, Owens had like really cool classic stuff. Yeah. I've been there in that shop and it was cool to see that, you know. Yeah really cool stuff really beautiful, beautiful kid in the stuff. candy store going into owens yeah very sensory very, overload yeah it's, yeah it's like oh yeah your brain's like wow it's so beautiful you know um so you know craig dickens makes some nice stuff everybody has like their little like niche you know edf makes a lot of levitation stuff a lot of you know stuff for they make stuff for and johnny gone you know he made a lot of stuff for doug henning and then, johnny gone's like the yoda of yeah, he made stuff that. for Zigfried and roy i mean you know, I mean, so did, uh, yeah, and I think Bill Smith made a lot of stuff for Lance. Uh, so, yeah, this, everybody has their little niches of styles they make. You know, like if you wanted a certain thing, you would go to Willie. If you wanted another certain thing, you would go to Bill, you know. Mm-hmm. Depends on what you wanted. They have their style that they, they, they do well with. Got it. Got it. Okay. Uh, and and uh, before we wrap this up, I just wanted to touch on this because I found it f- – I actually found this very fascinating. I don't know how much you've gone into this publicly, um, but you were, prior to Magic, you were into extreme sports, right? Yep. You you were a professional bodybuilder, correct? Well, I started off as bodybuilding in my later years and teenager years. Then I went into, I didn't like the politics of it and the subject yeah. of judging. Yeah. Um, and I went to, a friend of mine goes, oh, go lift what power lift that way if you lift the weight you lift it they couldn't they can't argue you if you lift it <laughs> yeah well, that makes sense okay so i started power lifting which is a completely different sport it's there's nothing about the physique that you care about it's just about being big and leveraging being your body pick lifting the thing weight. up yep just it's three lifts it's a deadlift and the weight comes up here off the ground bench press and a squat two legs are parallel and that's it three lifts so I did that, um, and I got into that pretty heavily. Uh, even took uh, you know synthetic uh, steroids to enhance my uh, uh, strength. Those pecs um, and biceps. Everything, yeah. Well, yeah. Overall strength, legs, quads. Right. Yeah, it was just you know, uh, and it wasn't you no know, not good. Uh, right. Pressure, and the blood pressure was high at a very young age, and yeah, it was not good. And then I met Slidini, and I you know, if you do my if you watch my Penn and Teller. Uh, show on YouTube, the intro really says it all. They did a really good job with it. It talks about how I met Slidini, how he took me back, got me back excited about magic, and I got out of, out of powerlifting. And mm. magic literally, you know, changed and saved my life, getting out of me that, getting me out of that world of uh, that crazy world, you know. So a toxic world, both both um, well, very physically toxic, based on what what you oh, felt yeah. compelled to take and and the mindset of probably promoted a mindset of never being good enough right because there was always somebody that could lift a heavier weight than you right or somebody that could you know that had a just ever so slightly more cut and it just it was like climbing this greased pole of perfection that you're never going to ever attain right it's all it's about it's all it's about you know it's about outdoing the next person constantly and you know my body i just replaced my hip last year a right yeah. hip and i'm like if i kept going i only did it for two years and wow. if I kept going, and, but i was very strong unfortunately and i say unfortunately because it, lot, it was got me into it more that i was good at it because you know i'm short five seven my benching was strong i did 455 you know 455 pound bench press i mean i mean i can't even imagine i came it's like another person you know i squatted 650 pounds that's that's pretty intense man that's that's amazing. It's a crazy weight, but the training to get to that is what kills your joints. You know, you're doing reps with 500 pounds squatting, you know, your hips are getting wrecked, you know, doing front squats with 325 pounds, you know, mm. yeah, your body's not meant for it, you know? So I was, that was the world I was in and that was good. If I didn't get back into magic, I would have probably continued because I would have probably started winning more contests. I came in second in my first contest in the state of the whole state of Connecticut, which is a huge state. Wow. Uh, of competitors so i came in second my very first contest that's 
very impressive. Yeah. I would have won if this guy didn't come out of retirement. Truman Back is a so remember his name. He came out of retirement to qualify for the nationals. So he had to had to compete in a, in a state competition first. But I like I saw this guy, I'm like, oh you know, it was this guy, he's in my weight class. Oh my god. Oops, he came out of retirement just to kick you out, out of the first place category. That's yeah, always a <laughs> Just crushed everybody. He was called the crane, man. He's like 725. Just he was a like deadlift king. Oh boy. And, but anyway, but that's the point. See, I would have to fight for that always. And that's not a good world. It's not a good world. I'm so happy it worked out the way it did. That's why I respect magic a lot. Because it's more to me than just doing a hobby. It's really I wouldn't be literally here without, you know, meeting Slidini first to get back on track. Then my mentor Bill Andrews would keep me going and get me a professional head and meeting you know uh, Norm Nielsen and later in LA and you know mm. I've had all these people I've met through the years Chuck Burns and you know all these people it just it was, it was just perfect you know we were, it worked out you know it was it was yeah it was the path that found you to yeah. say to save you I think yeah. I think you had some somebody or something looking out for you to to I find you know. When, when you're in that phase of life, I, I have these moments where I'm pursuing something where my mind says, oh yeah, this is what I really, really want to do. And it seems like every angle that I try keeps getting shut down and it just keeps on that way. When I get out of that or if I move to some other thing, I look back and I go, man, I was not meant to be doing that because when you look at the sequence of events, it was like something was just trying to block you out to, to kick you into something better. Which I think where, where you're at, obviously, is, is the better path for you. And you've clearly, you know, created a name for yourself. And that's why you're here on Making Magic. Thanks, buddy. Good to see right you. Right now. And this has been uh, a fantastic, inspiring interview with the one and only Tony Clark. Now, hey, Tony, man. before we go, where can listeners and viewers find out more about you? Well, you can go to my website. It's Tony Clark Magic or Tony Clark Magic Store. Both of them get you to, one's a performance site, but it sells a shop button on top. A link uh, right or, there that it's going to display. Yeah, or on Instagram, uh, Tony Clark Magic on Instagram. Facebook, Tony Clark Live slash Undercore Live. Uh, and that's it. I don't, I don't do Twitter. Um, I'm barely on Instagram. I try my best. I'm, you know, I'm like still. You're too busy out. making good stuff. You're too busy doing productive things with your life, right? Well, I like it. So you got to mix. You got. It's part of the world now, though. You right. Know? We never would have met without social media either. So, it would. It's nice that we had that available to us as well. So. That is very true. That is very true. Well, uh, this, like I said, Tony, you are a special gift to the magic community. Your story is very special, and that is why I have you here. And I think both the viewers and the listeners will appreciate everything that you had to say and will learn from our conversation. So uh, if you guys have enjoyed it, please subscribe. Click the red subscribe button. You know what to do. And click the thumbs up, like this video, share it with your friends, you can learn more about Tony. Or if you're just listening to the sound of our voice on Spotify, feel free to follow the show. Share it while you're listening it to in the car or cleaning up around the house. And, uh, be greatly appreciated so that's the way you can help support the show and help support this new well it's not a new way it's a classic way important way of thinking that i think a lot of people uh need more reminders of that we can be creative we can we can make things for ourselves and we shouldn't let our limitations whether it be money or location or whatever stop us from doing those things and creating what's there uh, manifesting our dreams. So uh, thanks again, Tony. And you guys have been watching another episode of Making Magic. Hope to see you soon in the next one. Bye for now. Hello, hello, hello.